I was doing a film for Sun Classic Films uh, up in Canada, up in Banff, Canada, and it was called The Snow Tigers. And the man that owned Sun Classic Films, his name was Patrick Frawley. And he was a very sharp guy. He owned Schick Razors and the Schick Shadell Clinic for alcohol and tobacco abuse. And so he bought Sun Classics to do commercials for the alcohol and tobacco abuse and for Schick Razors. They'd made Grizzly Adams once before with another actor. And I spent, they spent like a half a million dollars on the TV show. And it was actually a feature film. It wasn't a TV show at the time. But Mr. Foley was a very bright guy. And when he saw the footage, he didn't like it. And so he was watching some new dailies of a new film they were doing called The Snow Tigers, which I was working on. And he says, now that guy should be Grizzly Adams, not that other guy we had. And he says to my wife, she was a secretary at the time, he says, do you know that guy? And she goes, yeah, his name is Dan Haggerty. And he goes, well, isn't your name Haggerty? She goes, yes. And he goes, well, are you related to him? Oh, yeah, he's my husband. Well, call him up and tell him to come down here. I want to talk to him about a show called Grizzly Adams. So I came down from Canada, met this guy, and he said, look, I made a movie called Grizzly Adams, but I'm not crazy about it. How would you like to be Grizzly Adams as a young man, and the footage we have already will fade into the old character? And I said, no, I'd rather just do the whole thing myself. That's okay. Well, he says, we only have $185,000 left in the budget. I said, well, let's see what we can do. So seven of us went to Park City, Utah, and we filmed Grizzly Adams for $185,000, and it did very well. What Mr. Frawley did was he rented the theaters at the time and then ran his own ads in the newspaper for one week only, two weeks only. And what he did was he gave the theater owners the concession stands, and he got the theater tickets. And it did really well, and so he came back to me and said, let's do another film called Frontier Fremont. We'll have you play Frontier Fremont. And he did the same thing with that, and it did very well. So NBC was watching this four-walling, which it was called, and it was doing very, very well. And they liked Grizzly Adams because they held it over and over and over. And so they came to him and they said, would you like to do a TV series? And, uh, you know, Mr. Foley said, well, that would be a great idea. So they came to me and they said, would you like to do a series? I said, gosh, that would be terrific. So just out of an accident, this little show became what it was, and it became an icon in the 70s and the 80s. And it was a great marriage. We had a great time, got along fine. Don Shanks was a wonderful guy. I loved working with Don. Working with the animals was just, it was a thrill. It was very easy for me to do because being an animal trainer and a stunt guy, I had lions and chimps and leopards and all kinds of things. So working with the bear and the eagle and all that was a very natural thing for me to do. Denver Pyle was just a real, real professional, a real great man. And I mean, he was Dinah Shore's dad and, you know, Dukes of Hazard. Denver had been around for a long time, worked with John Wayne. Don Denver worked with everybody. And I remember one day I was squinting, you know, that we had a, you know, big shiny boards and we were squinting. And he said, all right, stop the roll. I said, Danny, he said, Danny, now don't squint. He said, look, count to 10, close your eyes, look straight at the sun, and at the end of 10, just look at the camera and say, roll them. And so whenever you're doing any photographs or still photographs, and the sun and the shiny boards aren't looking at you, and it's hard for you, you're squinting, just close your eyes, look at the sun, count to 10, open your eyes, and they'll adjust. Boom, you won't squint a bit. So he helped me a lot with different things like that, which is very minor, but at the same time, you don't want to be blinking all the time on camera, and you don't want to be squinting. So Denver was a real big help to me, and I loved working with Denver. He was a terrific professional, and uh, the crew was, was great. They were terrific. I mean, we were like a family. It was like one young, youthful, growing family back in the 70s, having a great time, loving what we were doing. I mean, it was great to get up and go to work. I mean, I look forward to it. I'd like to do it right now. It would be terrific. But, you know, we'd drive out in location. I'd get the bear and the eagle and whatever we did, and everybody was happy. I think that we became very, very comfortable, and it was pretty basic, you know. I mean, you opened it up, you know, up in the mountains and the bear, and you had a wagon train coming through it. There wasn't a ton of stories that you could do, but you could make stories going on and on and on, you know, traveling shots. And what would happen, we would film in Park City, Utah, and they saw that most of the country got a lot of snow. And so the snow shows weren't really rated strong. 
They saw that people that were watching the shows in New York and New Jersey and things like that didn't like watching me in the snow and then walking outside and having to stomp around in the snow and shovel snow. So what we would do is we'd go to Ruidoso, New Mexico in Payson, Arizona. And we had three little cabins that we would go and shoot at. And when it got too deep for snow in Park City, we'd go to Ruidoso or to, you know, Payson, Arizona. So we had three different locations, but it all looked like the same spot. So it was like God was very nice to us, and it never snowed in our backyard. I'd give it 75% on the, we stayed to the script. And then it would change quite a bit, you know. I mean, weather happens. The animals would be a little bit different. Each day was different. And working with the 600-pound grizzly bear, I mean, she had her moments. She didn't want to work every day. And, you know, in confined areas, you know, where it was very uncomfortable at times, we would just improvise. And it wasn't that much to improvise. I mean, here you were out there in God's backyard, and you got rivers and streams and waterfalls and hawks and raccoons and eagles and skunks and beaver and wolverines. I mean, a little bit of everything. But we would work together, and we'd get the basic concept of the script, and we would knock it out. And we would do a show every six days. 45 minutes and we do a show every six days was was pretty we moving right along I mean different locations and everything like that but I got a one-room cabin here and everybody comes by my cabin blind people buffaloes that need an ankle fixed I mean and I don't have a wife you know I'm going crazy out here and I couldn't eat meat old mad jack would bring me hard tack and biscuits and bacon and stuff but it was like come on man Maybe somebody could come by and I could fall in love with an Indian or something, you know, have a nice little Indian woman and we could have a family. They ran a survey on it and said, they don't want you to get married. They do not want you to get married. And I said, why? And they said, well, they've done surveys and tests on it. And everybody that watches this show, if they're in their motor home and they break down out in the mountains, who's going to come save them but Grizzly Adams? I'm going, please. But I never did get a wife. And I never did, uh, I mean, all I ate was <laughs> hard tack and pancakes, and I should have been 500 pounds after eating all those pancakes. I'm going, Mad Jack, you got to bring me something to eat here. Sick of eating radishes and roots and tree bark, man. But he goes, no, you're looking healthy. You're looking fine. So that was kind of funny. I'm telling you, that Jack's recipe is just about the best I've ever had. There's no denying that. You know, I don't even remember Ma's flap Jack's tasting this good. What was it, man? You know, I don't know that. I don't, they did that at the studio, you know. I mean, and all my guys, everybody that worked on the shit, the stunt guys, they go, oh, yeah, Danny, I know, I know. They'd all pretend like they were the bear and everything like that. Thank you. <laughs> Just gonna appreciate just one candle on the cake. You know, if we were to put all the candles that belong on the cake, we'd probably pass out from the heat. <laughs> Shh. Don't you tell Jack I said that. How do you like this, Ben? Mm -hmm. I'm carving it for Jack. Well, it's supposed to be number seven. Well, I know it needs a little work. I think the beauty and the simplicity of it was something that was very comfortable. And everybody said, well, did you do your own stunts? And was the, what was the bear like? The bear played the part of a male, but it was really a female. And lastly, was a boy and played a girl. And I don't know if Hollywood will ever get it right, man. Just let be what should be. Now, the original Grizzly Adams, James Capon Adams, lived in the 1700s, 1800s. And his hero was George Washington. And George Washington's wife was Martha Washington. So he called his little grizzly cub Martha Washington. And I said, look. Just let me call it Martha Washington because my bear is a female and we had raised her from a baby and everything. And I think when somebody sees that little cabin and I get up in the morning and I open the door and this 600-pound bear comes walking out and I come walking out rubbing my eyes going, well, it's another beautiful day, Ben. People are going, this is incredible. A guy living up in the woods with a 600-pound bear. Well, the real Grizzly Adams, he called his bear Martha Washington. And when she came into Estrus, she wandered off. He didn't really keep her as a pet. He came and went, and she came and went. And she comes back one season 
with two cubs. Now this gets around to the Indians and they're going, this guy's incredible because they idolize the Wolverine and the grizzly bear and all of a sudden Grizzly Adams has three grizzly bears and he didn't have a burrow and he really didn't have a great friend like Mad Jack so he used these bears to carry all his pots and pans and all of his goods that he had to live up in the mountains with. So here's this guy wandering through the woods with three giant grizzly bears, which is an awesome thing. Well, since my bear was a male, they couldn't have it have two little cubs and everything. So Ben and I, we were both single bachelors, man, living up in the woods. But anyway, it was warm, it was heart filling. I was happy, the bear was happy, and you thought it was gonna last forever. It could have gone on a little bit longer than it did, but you know, it wasn't that it was not pulling good ratings. I think Mr. Silverman at NBC wanted to do more sitcom comedy, and so they replaced it with some sitcom comedy. And, but I think I received over eight million fan letters, and NBC received just tons of mail going, why did you take a good family show off the air? And I'm the only guy to ever be on the cover of TV Guide twice in six months. And in fact, I didn't even know I was on the cover of TV Guide. I was at a market one day buying some tangerines and the little girl behind the cash register, she's going, is that you on the cover of TV Guide? And I went, wow, how did that, what happened? Now I knew that they took pictures of me, but I didn't know that it was gonna be on the cover of TV Guide. So I really didn't know that it was gonna be successful. And, we kind of made everybody aware that God's backyard is something that should be taken care of. Animals should be taken care of. Grizzly Adams was the kind of a character that loved what he did and loved, loved nature, and nature was responding to him. So people were really watching this. I didn't realize that when you were out there, you know, and you got raccoons over here and squirrels and the bear, and you know, I mean, it's like, uh, is this really happening? And, and then all of a sudden, I remember watching it for the first time. This guy became a legend, you know, in the song and the running through the field with the yellow flowers and my little wolf, you know, son. And it was just like, it was like a dream. And then all of a sudden people were going, oh, you're him. Oh, man. Hi. And I'm going, yeah. And it was like overwhelming. It was really overwhelming when people like said, well, we love you and you've helped my son. You've helped my family. You don't know, realize how many people you've touched over the years. That was an awesome feeling. So from that point, making people happy, what more can a man ask for? You know, I mean, a couple of animals and working in the backyard of God's wonderful planet that I had the opportunity to do. And with Denver and with the Indian and the guest stars, it was one of the highlights of my life. You couldn't ask for anything better than that. You really couldn't. So I got to thank you people for watching the show. And when you go out and you pick up these DVDs and you remember a little moment, you go, I remember that show.